This is the first thing I ever did on motorcycling. It was in uh, 1967, which was, uh, it's now 2005, so that was a uh, uh, long time ago. Anyway, uh, I got interested in motorcycles after buying a little 50cc Honda step through that I used to ride around the hills of Dana Point, which were totally vacant at the time. And in doing that, a bunch of my surf buddies like Hobie and Gordon Clark and the Hoffman brothers, Mike Ake and Jimmy Lomas, sort of got into it too. And uh, one thing led to another. I was the first one to buy a big bike, which seemed like a Harley Hog, but what it was was a 200cc Triumph Cub that set on the tank the world's fastest motorcycle. And of course, not knowing anything about it, I believed it. It turned out, I rode quite a few desert races in this thing, and uh, not knowing much about it, but uh, I guess they were one of the most unreliable motorcycles the world has ever known. But uh, we didn't know that, so we didn't have much trouble. In fact, we rode one of these motorcycles from Ensenada to Cabo San Lucas uh, back in the early 60s before hardly anyone had done that. It took us seven days, and instead of riding back, we just rode them up onto an airplane, Mexican airliner, and leaned them up against the seat and flew home. Anyway, those guys all sort of got into it, got big bikes, started racing, and uh, joined the Victor's Motorcycle Club and put on a hare and hound race. Hobie called me up and said, you know, would you be interested in filming it? And I said, well, see what I can do. I'll, I'll see if I can make some kind of a deal to bro get it broadcast on television. So that's what came about, this uh, 1967 hare and hound race. This desert race was held in Lucerne Valley, California, put on by the Victor's Motorcycle Club that a bunch of the surf guys join. They lay out the course but can't ride it. And all the other entrants, 801 of them, have never seen the course. You can't pre-run it or cheat and go check it out. Doing this stuff, we uh, Frequently used friends and neighbors. Uh, Brennan McClellan, who since passed away, was our pit reporter. He was an old surf buddy from Laguna Beach. Dick Vick, who was a fireman in uh, Los Angeles, moved to San Clemente and was the number one desert holder. So he was like our hero in the early days of uh, our motorcycle riding. Brennan talking to Dick. Well, these bikes are specially designed for cross-country racing and you, we start off on the front end we have a uh, large tire um, coming to the front forks the front forks are, are specially designed uh, there's approximately eight and a quarter inches of travel there uh, the gas tank is is extra large a little over four gallon capacity sometimes out here you have to run for three hours uh, without stopping and it's a very poor uh, situation when you run out of gas uh, we fit a large capacity air cleaner to these bikes. This is very important because you can destroy your engine out here in one hour if you don't take special <coughs> care of your air cleaner. The race was two separate loops, about 50 miles each, out to a smoke bomb, and you've got to hit all the checkpoints to get your uh, tank card marked. Make sure you don't cut the course. And back into the pits, fuel up, and then out for a separate loop. That's a hare and hound. A hare scrambles is where you go around the same loop more than once. The victors guys marking the course. I think this is Hobie with his uh, paper bag bag on with lime, with ribbons, arrows. Don't go that way then various danger markings. Down arrow means danger. Stripes across the trail mean danger. Brennan talking to one of the uh, riders about getting lost, Jack Byers, who lives in Northern California now and races pigeons, I hear. Well, uh, the leaders usually don't get lost because they're up out of the dust. But the fellas that uh, are back in the dust, they can get lost because they don't stay on the course. 
And if you don't stay on the course and follow the line, it's very easy to get lost in that big area out there. Brennan with Steve Hurd about what he thinks is the worst danger. Nice hairdo, Steve. I think hidden rocks are the worst thing. They get behind bushes, and if you don't see them, it can put you down pretty quick. And Gary Conrad. Well, the main thing, and especially as dusty as it's going to be today, is to get a good start and uh, just work it from there and uh, play it cool. Don't get overexcited where you're going to crash or anything if you can help it. And just uh, keep a steady pace going. The motorcycles were primarily big 650 Triumphs, BSAs, Nortons, and the two strokes weren't all that popular yet. Everybody gets their tank card marked. Gary Preston, Jay and Roberts, one of the uh, Lady Victors sponsoring club. Out to a smoke bomb, which is a pile of burning tires, which you probably can't do that anymore. It's a Le Mans start. Bikes, motors off. Most of them didn't have kickstands, so they prop them up with a stick. This is still one of my favorite shots was uh, Nelson Tyler in the helicopter with Davy Jones as the pilot. Nelson invented the vibrationless helicopter mount, which prior to that, he just sort of hung out the door of the helicopter and got a real shaky picture. So this was like really revolutionary photography at the time. And Nelson was one of the few guys that could really make the thing work well. pre-run the, to the smoke bomb, so they had their own lines and whatnot. But once the smoke bomb, they'd never seen the course before. This is Buck Smith, who has since uh, unfortunately passed away. Ride the big fire breathe and triumph. Of course, funnel into a narrow canyon, and Buck Smith was the first guy through there. First guy to unload in the canyon was uh, Howard Beach. shot this in the 16 millimeter. At the time, the video cameras were gigantic things that were really only good for the studio. And uh, also with 16 millimeter, we could shoot in slow motion, which you couldn't really do in video. You can see these motorcycles didn't have a whole lot of suspension compared to modern bikes. I think Dick Mann put it perfectly, though, when he said, you know, the old bikes, we rode to the limit, but we weren't going that fast. The new bikes, they still ride to the limits, but they're going so much faster that when they unload, they've got a lot further to walk back to get their bike. Buck Smith was still leading. Roberts coming up through the pack with his uh, football shoulder pads on. 
Nobody wore any uh, armor in those days. Bill Fryan on a 250 Greaves. My uh, youngest son, Wade, did the music for this 2005 version of the Desert Race. And my grandson, Wes, resurrected these old things and did a re-edit on them. So it's kind of all in the family. Kicking a big four-stroke that's hot 50 times is just like riding about 100 miles, especially when it's 100 degrees out. Once in a while, riding one of the desert races, you get so separated from the pack that you think you're lost. And the, by then, the lime's all worn away, and uh, you know a lot of people ended up getting way lost. And even if you aren't lost, as long as you think you're lost, and get sort of a semi-anxiety attack. Buck Smith still in the lead, flagman out warning about a road crossing is dangerous. We talked to Dick Vick about the danger marking. For danger marking, they'll put three line marks across a trail. For a road crossing, they put six marks across a trail. It's very important to stay on the trail. If you get off the trail, you will not see these danger marks and it can be uh, very disastrous. about desert racers, they always seem to be in a pretty good mood when they unload. A BSA 441 Victor, I had one of those things, had to be one of the worst motorcycles ever made, at least for the desert. First checkpoint, it's Mike Burke, one of the checkers. Everybody's wondering where he came from. Followed by his uh, buddy, Doyle Fields, another member of the checkers. He was the original leader, Buck Smith. Followed by Gary Preston. Dan Roberts coming through. All getting their tank cards marked. Mike Burke has also passed away, along with his buddy Doyle Fields. Across the dry lake, probably 100 miles an hour. We had like uh, 20 cameras covering this thing. We had them spread out on the first loop and then a plan to uh, move them so they could also get on the second, film on the second loop. So we had a, effectively about 40 different camera locations. And of course the helicopter with Nelson Tyler and, and uh, Davy Jones, the pilot, who were just amazing what they could do. Buck Smith and Gary Preston. They 
there goes J.N. Roberts on his Husqvarna, which was kind of a new motorcycle at the time for the United States. Turns out that Mike and Doyle had uh, taken a road and uh, cut the course, so they were eventually disqualified. It seemed like every desert race there'd be some kind of a bottleneck where everyone would get jammed up. That was kind of part of the deal. The amazing thing about some of these bottlenecks were I never saw anybody get mad at each other. It was always like, uh, you know, you run into somebody or jam it and they kind of look at you and go, are you having fun? Roberts wore uh, football shoulder pads. Nobody had any kind of armor they wore in those days. He also wore like uh, baseball catcher's knee pads, Buck Smith, flat tire. picking up the line and making the corner. When you're going that fast, it's, it's, it's easy to miss some of the corners and miss some of the markings. Jan misses the corner and catches out of the corner of his eye and gets back on the course without losing much time. Desert racing back then was, it was pretty much virgin desert. It wasn't all whooped out. You could pretty much you know, run a desert race anywhere you wanted to. So that was part of the challenge for the different clubs was to you know find a new area and lay out a new course. Very much club oriented, there was like the checkers and the victors and the viewfinders and the shamrocks and most of them wearing their uh, colors of the club they were in. This is some of the really great helicopter photography that was pretty darn new at the time. As I said before, you know, just hanging out the door of the helicopter with a handheld camera, it was shaking all over the place. Where Nelson and Davy Jones were just an amazing group of people, or amazing team. They got so close to Jan one time, I think, that they uh, he actually hit his uh, shoulder on the skid. Mike Burke with a flat, kind of poetic justice. Preston, followed by Whitey Martino. Malcolm Smith, Whitey and I went to the six-day trials uh, when we were doing on a Sunday. And I think Whitey is uh, living in uh, Sonoma County up in Northern California.
most of the clubs had their banners up for, for the pitting, so the riders, you know, knew where to pull in. Brennan talked to Hobie Alter of uh, Hobie Surfboards, Hobie Cats, etc., etc., one of my old surf buddies, and the guy who actually talked me into covering this race. On the surface they are, but it's, it's still an individual sport. It's a balanced, fun, thrill sport, especially this riding in the open desert. It's an individual sport, and uh, it's a good group of people, too. Jan Roberts with a big lead going into one of the checkpoints. Followed by Gary Preston. riders that started, only about 400 made it through this checkpoint. Into the pits with Jay and Roberts with a pretty good sized lead. Fuel, a drink of water, and whatever else you want to do. Well, try to keep a cool head and make sure you get a, a good pit, get your tank full, get your goggles a dirty wipe them off, this means quite a bit being able to see, of course, and if you're thirsty, get a quick drink of water. I'd consider uh, 15 seconds a good pit stop. I think it took Jan a little longer than uh, 15 seconds. getting his uh, tank marked before it goes out to the second loop. Only in a desert race can you get lost in the pits. JN can't quite pick up the line to know which way the second loop goes. Finally somebody in the crowd points away to him. Gary Preston in the pits, running in second. Whitey Martino getting a little wheel adjustment. Brenda McClellan, our man in the pits. Jim, how's it going so far? Okay, everything's fine except for the front rim. Good luck. He hit a rock. Congratulations. Bob. It's rough. He says it's rough. He wants a cigarette. The gas is going to stand by for a fire. We're backing off now. He's getting for a cigarette and there he goes, number 66. How's it going, Don? Fine, everything's wonderful. This is uh, really a tremendous excitement. Goggles wiped off, water in the mouth, gas in the gas tank. The pit stops are averaging about 10 seconds. Other motorcycles are roaring by as they go to their respective pits to be gassed up. How's it going out on the track? Very. Not much more than one word or two from each of these drivers as they come into the pit stop. The engine's racing, being gassed up, making last minute adjustments as one half of the loop of the complete course is being made. Check this out, pretty darn close.
Running in second place was Gary Preston, followed by Bill Bryant on a 250 Greaves. Gary's on a big fire breathing 650 trial. In the tight and twisty stuff, the little 250 Greaves had a big advantage. But in the sand wash, the big triumphs had the advantage. In fourth place was Larry Berquist on a BSA. Unfortunately, Larry also passed away. J.N. Roberts in one of the final checkpoints. Followed by Gary Preston, who obviously passed uh, Brian in the wash with more power. And here comes Bill Bryant. Larry Berkowitz comes through the checkpoint in fourth. By this point, there were only 250 riders left out of the 801 that started. Jan was a carpenter, lived in Sun Valley, California, and was 25 years old at the time. We talked to J.N. about his training routine. To keep in shape for riding, I do a lot of riding. If I can stand on the pegs the whole race, I feel that I have a great advantage over the competition due to the fact that your legs act as a second set of shock absorbers. You can always ride better the first part of the race due to the fact that you aren't tired. When you do get tired, you start getting sloppy and you'll make a lot more mistakes. If you can't read the terrain fast, you're just not going to go fast. But you have to concentrate at all times. Uh, you drop your guard once, you're going to get off. When you get off going fast, you're going to get hurt. We did this uh, stop motion thing with JN. Figuring we're really pretty brilliant to do it. Jan, now in his 60s, is still riding motorcycles and riding them very well. The recent Baja 1000, he uh, co rode with his son, and they finished uh, pretty well. The Husqvarna was a relatively new motorcycle in the U.S. It was imported by a fellow named Edison Dye from San Diego, and Malcolm was one of the first dealers. Of course, we all had to get Huskies because uh, Malcolm was our pal, and he sold them, and they seemed like the uh, secret weapon. But through Edison and the Husqvarna, that was really the start of uh, sort of modern motocross in the United States. We put a helmet camera on Reed Price and sent him out trying to chase JN down. Reed was the guy that had the 90cc Yamaha and when I got my 200cc Triumph Cub, told me I was gonna get killed in that big thing. A couple years later, he was the number one desert plate holder. Conrad talking about riding in the sand. Well, the secret to sand is speed. You can't beat speed because you get up on top of the sand and then you're just like riding on pavement once you get on top. And if you don't have the speed, then you're in trouble. When you get toward the end and you get a bottleneck or a deep sand wash, 
you're getting pretty darn tired. Makes it even harder to get out of the place. Almost every desert race had some killer uphill and killer downhill to uh, sort of spice it up. Some of the downhills you'd look over the edge and go, wow, I don't know if I really want to go down there. Here again, Gary Conrad. Well, just uh, keep the bike upright and get through it. Uh, you might be going slower than the other guys, but if you can get up through it and stay upright without uh, losing your balance, and you'll come out a lot better. Guy's got a two-piece handlebar. I had a real special relationship with Wide World of Sports. I would uh, shoot the film independently, and they had the right to broadcast it once, and then I would retain all the other rights to the film. So it worked out perfect for me, because I could sort of do it independently the way I wanted, and they could broadcast it, and then I could uh, keep all the other rights to the film. While well, Jan's got a big lead, these guys battling out back in the pack for who knows what place, but they still are need water, they're tired, but they want to get to the finish. And Jan Roberts at the finish. There's hardly any spectators in desert racing. Almost everybody there is just another rider or pit crew or your friend. Jan across the line and Brennan McClellan was right there. Beautiful, Robbie, beautiful. Breathe. Hey, let me have that. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I gotta do it. That's <laughs> it. Do it Gary Preston in second place. And Larry Burquist in third place on his BSA. Four? And fourth overall and first 250 lightweight was Bill Fryer. Jenna McClellan with JN. Beautiful race. JN, how did it go? Riding a 360 Husqvarna. Well, it was pretty rough the whole course. I mean, uh, you know. What gave you the most particular trouble? All the real soft sand and the tight washes back there. Pretty much low gear. I noticed you've got shoulder pads and shin guards on, and some of the boys I've talked to say they really help. Yeah, well, I broke my collarbone a few thousand times, so I wear them now, you know, to keep from uh, breaking them again if possible. Congratulations, great win, nice going. The neat thing about a desert race, when you finish, even though you're bruised and got blisters and tired and dehydrated, you really sort of had a sense of accomplishment that you, you made the thing. It takes a while to collect all the bikes, if you can find them, because there was about 600 of them out there. The next number one desert plate holder, but he needs to wear some elbow guards. That's my youngest son, Wade, who did the music for this piece, and uh, my wife with my daughter Nancy in the oven. That's my uh, oldest son Dana standing beside that uh, blue car. He's also a filmmaker now, having done 
surf film step in liquid and uh, covered the bottom of thousands with a feature film called Dust of Glory. This is Bruce Brown. Thanks for watching The Heron Hound from 1967.